But I want to give you one more, one more level, which I'll call the deepest level of the New Testament writings. The New Testament manifests a relationship of worship between the church and Jesus. One of discipleship, but also one of worship. In Revelation chapter 1, Revelation again is, took the East a while to get comfortable with, with the book of Revelation. <coughs> In the book, angels appear here and there in the narrative to the prophet John who's writing the book. And when he sees the angel, he falls down as though dead and, and, and falls down before them. And they say, you mustn't do that. I'm just a creature. I'm just a servant of God. Worship only God, which is a good rule of thumb, okay? But when Jesus appears in Revelation 1, looking pretty awesome, <laughs> Uh, not in the California sense, in the true, actual sense of awesome. The prophet John falls down as though dead, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus doesn't say, you mustn't do that. Worship God only. In fact, he encourages it by saying things um, reminiscent of the character of Yahweh. But I want to look at a couple of other places because, like I said, Revelation took a while to be respected. And some people think of it as happening on the later side. So what if the church sort of drifted into the worship of Jesus? They're, they're gradually amping up their own, self, uh, their own perceptions of Jesus and arriving later at the conviction that he is divine and worthy of worship. Well, let's look at two texts that I think show that it happens pretty early. The first one is Philippians 2. But I don't want to go to Philippians 2 first. I want to go to Isaiah 45 as a backdrop. If you have a Bible, turn it to Isaiah 45. This is after Israel has failed as a state, lost its throne, been exiled, destroyed, you know, over. Everybody thought it was game over except for the prophets. And now, uh, late in Isaiah, we get this, um, this reminder. When returning Israel <coughs> remembers the promises of their restoration, they'll realize that God has been with them all along, that God had not abandoned them, that God was real, the gods of the nations that were wrong, I mean, they seemed powerful for a season, but their power failed. They turn out not to be who the nations think they are. So, logically, whom do you follow? Do you follow the one God beside whom there are no others, no rivals? Or do you follow wood and stone? To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue swear loyalty. Does that sound a little familiar? They shall say, only through Yahweh can I find victory in might. When people trust in him, all their adversaries are put to shame. It's through Yahweh that all the offspring of Israel have vindication and glory. Everyone who is saved will turn to me to be saved. All the ends of the earth. Not just the remnants of Israel that are scattered, but all the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah 45. And that becomes the backdrop of an early Christian uh, hymn, maybe, that Paul either writes or passes along to the church at Philippi. So take a look at Philippians 2. God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Okay, what? He's given Jesus the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Do you hear the echo of Isaiah 45? <clears throat> In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether, you know, this might be original to Paul, although it doesn't sound like Paul's usual way of speaking. So it might be an earlier song or poem 
or a verse of some kind that, that Paul is quoting and forwarding, you know, like, like I might quote a hymn in class, which means it's earlier than Paul. It's either Paul's own or earlier to Paul to do this extraordinary thing, to take Isaiah 45, a text that says, turn to me and be saved. I am the Lord. There is no other. Don't worship idols. Don't follow those who can't save. To me, every knee will bow. To me, every tongue will confess loyalty. Some Christian or some church took me, crossed it out, and wrote Jesus. Jesus is the name that every tongue will confess. The name above every name. Jesus Christ is Lord. The word Lord here is significant. Sometimes the word Lord just means sir. It's just a title of respect. All right? Think of Monty Python movies. My Lord means boss. You know, sometimes people call you boss. Um, if I were to receive, you know, if I receive a letter, it's a Mr. Telford work or whatnot. If it were a Greek letter, it might say, Kyrios Telford work, Lord Telford work. It sounds pretty exalted, it just means sir. Um, sometimes the word Kyrios, which is the Greek word for Lord, sometimes Kyrios uh, is translated sir in the New Testament. When the woman at the well says, Kyrios, I perceive that you're a prophet. Well, does she, is she like worshiping him there? Is she calling him Yahweh? No, she probably doesn't know enough to do that at that point. She's probably just saying, sir, you're a prophet, my Lord. However, the word doesn't just mean that title of respect. The word Yahweh, the name in Exodus 3, Yahweh, came to be held as holy and really beyond um, common use. And so Jews wouldn't use it. Instead, they would avoid using the name by using a different Hebrew word, Adonai, which means Lord. So to this day in a synagogue, if you're reading the scripture aloud in a synagogue, the Hebrew um, scriptures, and you come upon the four letters, you know, Yod, He, Vav, Hey, you don't say them out loud. You don't say Yahweh. You substitute the word Adonai. Okay? He who must not be named. <laughs> Except he's named by the high priest in the Day of Atonement in the temple. I don't have a temple anymore, so he's never named. And the vowels for Adonai are the vowels that are in the text around the consonants YHWH to remind you to say Adonai instead. If you use the consonants of Yahweh and the vowels of Adonai, you end up with Yehovah. You end up with Jehovah, which whatever it is, <coughs> isn't God's original name because it's the vowels of a different word attached to the consonants of a different word. At any rate, Jews were in the habit of using the circumlocution Adonai instead of Yahweh. When the Old Testament needed to be translated so that it would make sense to Greek-speaking Jews in the centuries right before Jesus, um, what do you do when you're translating the Bible into Greek? I'm talking about the Jewish Hebrew scriptures into Greek. When they came up, up against the uh, word Yahweh, they used the Greek equivalent of Adonai. They used Kyrios. So the Greek Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, uses that word, Kyrios, wherever the Hebrew Bible uses Yahweh. The Greek, the Greek Old Testament is using Kyrios in Isaiah 45. I am Kyrios, and there is no other. So, at least in texts like Philippians 2, 
every tongue will confess not that Jesus Christ is Sir. Good grief. What does that mean? Every tongue will confess that Jesus, who has the name of every name, is Kyrios. It's clearly standing in for, for the name above every name, the name that God gave Moses. Jesus is the Yahweh to whom all knees will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So it's at least as old as Paul's ministry that Christians are worshiping Jesus and doing some pretty bold stuff to do it. I mean, taking, taking Isaiah 45, taking texts that gravely warn us to worship only God and using those texts to worship Jesus, that's pretty gutsy. That's pretty out in front. And that is already happening in Paul's churches and arguably even before. 